Hello and welcome to Insight Ophthalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to the UVI Tech series. Today we are studying the introduction and various important classifications especially given by the Sun group of uveitis. So what is meant by uvia? Uh, uvia? uvia is actually a highly vascular layer which is also called the middle layer which is present between the retina which is present inside and sclera present outside. It is a highly vascular layer and the principal function of this vascular layer is to provide nutrition to the eyeball. Now the uvia consists of three parts mainly the iris which is present here, the ciliary body and posteriorly we have all this here marked in green is the choroid. Now the iris which is present in front of the lens and forms the pupil is also responsible for metabolism of the anterior segment that is the cornea and the part of the anterior part of the lens through diffusion of important nutrients into the aqueous humor which is present in the anterior chamber. Now ciliary body which is present here is basically responsible for the production of the aqueous humor which will bathe the avascular structures present in the anterior segment. Now we know that our cornea does not have vessels and similarly the lens also does not have any kind of vascular supply. So their nutrition is basically supplied by the anterior uveal structures and these are the iris and the ciliary body. Then the third part of the uvea is the choroid and the choroid is present posteriorly and it is responsible for supplying the nutrition to the retina and it is particularly the outer layers of the retina which are supplied by the uh, which are supplied by the choroid. The vascularity of uvea is also very detrimental or disadvantages uh, to the uvea because it gets involved in many of the systemic uh, problems also. So whenever there is systemic inflammation, uvea can get involved because of its vascularization. Systemic infections also can infect uvea because directly uh, the only part of the eye which has blood vessels is actually the uvea and these infections can straight away come to uvea and cause uveitis. Similarly, systemic vascular diseases also can affect uvea because of the vascularization which is present in the uvea. So uh, on the pro side vascularization helps in nu providing nutrition to the eyeball. However, because it is vascularized uvea can also get involved in various systemic problems. So inflammation of the uvea is basically called uveitis. However, uh, this inflammation could be because of inflammatory disorders. This inflammation could be a response to various systemic infections as well, toxins or hypersensitivity reactions. So all those things will combinedly be called as uveitis. Okay. So again, there was a sun group classification, which is the standardization of uveitis nomenclature that forms the sun group this has this uh, sun working group has actually classified uveitis based on the various anatomy so as i showed you over here this iris and ciliary body they actually form the anterior part of the uvea the ciliary body is again divided into two parts that is the pars plicata and the pars plana the pars plicata is the part of the ciliary body which is thrown into these processes through which the zonules of the lens are actually attached right so the part of parts plicata comes in the uh, under the anterior uvea and the parts plana will come under the intermediate uvea then the choroid is uh, forming the part of the posterior uvea now the sun working group classified it anatomically into anterior uveitis intermediate uveitis posterior uveitis and pan uveitis. Now, as the name suggests, the anterior uveitis will involve the anterior part of the uvea. And all these are actually coming based on the primary site of inflammation. So in anterior uveitis, the iris and the parts plicata of the ciliary body will get involved. And the site of inflammation is basically the anterior chamber. Based on that, again, anterior uveitis is divided into the iritis when the site of inflammation is iris predominantly, iridocyclitis when the site of inflammation is iris and ciliary body, and anterior cyclitis when only the ciliary body is getting involved. Then we have intermediate uveitis, and in intermediate uveitis, the site of inflammation will be vitreous. In this again, we have posterior cyclitis in which only the pars plana will get involved. Hyalitis, that means it affects the anterior hyaloid or the 
vitreous and pars blinitis is actually an idiopathic type of intermediate uveitis in which there is no systemic disorders associated right so that's a different uh, term which is very similar to posterior cyclitis however in pars blinitis you will have two specific uh, signs which are snow banking and snowballs which i will describe to you in my video on intermediate uveitis okay so for now remember that pars blinitis uh, is a type of idiopathic intermediate uveitis then the third group was the posterior uveitis now the posterior uveitis basically involves the retina and the choroid so again it was classified into focal multifocal or diffuse choroiditis in which only the choroid was involved chorioretinitis or retinochoroiditis in this the first letter the first half of the word will tell you from where the inflammation is coming so in chorioretinitis the inflammation is coming from the choroid basically and involving the retina and in retinochoroiditis the inflammation site is basically the retina and then it is involving the choroid then the third type of posterior uveitis will be retinitis in which only the retina will be involved and ret neuroretinitis in which the disc and the retina will be involved okay so these are the classification of the uveitis based on the anatomy now what is meant by pan uveitis pan uveitis is when all the three uh, anatomical locations of the uvea will get involved that means your anterior uveitis plus intermediate uveitis plus posterior uveitis so your anterior chamber gets involved the vitreous chamber gets involved the retina and the choroid will also get involved now based upon the clinical presentation the sun working group has again described uveitis into various types okay so based upon how it occurs based upon the onset the uveitis can be sudden that means it occurs quite suddenly or in serious that means it occurs in a hidden form slowly over a period of time now based upon the duration for which it is present it can be classified into uveitis of limited duration in which the duration is less than 3 months and persistent uveitis in which duration is more than 3 months of duration so that is limited and persistent based upon the course as to how it progresses again uveitis can be classified into acute recurrent and chronic in acute uveitis it is classified as the episode characterized by sudden onset and limited duration that means it occurred suddenly and it was of limited duration that means less than 3 months of duration so that kind of uveitis is called acute uveitis in recurrent uveitis again you will have repeated episodes of uveitis but they will be separated by the periods of inactivity without treatment for more than 3 months in duration okay so in recurrent classification the duration is more than 3 months however the inactivity will be there and you have not treated the patient okay so in recurrent what you need to remember is it is inactivity without treatment for more than 3 months and so what is happening is that the patient is developing uveitis and then for more than 3 months he is normal without even treatment and then again it recurs so that is called recurrent uveitis then coming to chronic uveitis in chronic uveitis patient will have persistent uveitis that means uveitis more than 3 months duration and again there will be relapse within 3 months after discontinuing the treatment so here the patient is getting treated he is having a chronic course long duration of uveitis more than 3 months then we are treating him and then when once we stop the treatment the patient is going to develop the uveitis again within 3 months so that is the classification of crud uveitis based on the sun working group based on the onset duration and course so this is very important specifically the recurrent and chronic uveitis which are often the site of confusion now based on the pathology or the pathological classification uveitis can be classified into two types one is suppurative uveitis in which you will have lots of exudation and specifically the purulent exudation that means you get pus and the other one is the non suppurative uveitis in which you do not get any purulent exudation now in non suppurative uveitis you have again two types non granulomatous uveitis and granulomatous uveitis so let us first see what is meant by this purulent or suppurative uveitis so as the word suggests there is purulence that means pus or the purulent discharge 
in the case of virulent or suppurative uveitis so you can see basically you will have lots of uh, pus deposition as you can see here there is a hypopion so basically the example of this virulent or suppurative uveitis is the endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis okay so in endophthalmitis you have inflammation and infection of the uveal tissue along with that the purulent discharge is going to come from this uveal tissue and pour in the anterior chamber leading to the hypopion formation which will settle down because of the gravity which you can see here and then again in the vitreous also you will have purulent exudation so there will be pus cells or there will be vitreous cells and exudates in the vitreous cavity also so that is what is called as endophthalmitis and the same endophthalmitis when it involves even the tenons capsule which is covering the eye globe that is called the panophthalmitis so here basically the infection is occurring by the pus forming organism that is a pyogenic organisms particularly like staphylococcus streptococcus pseudomonas pneumococcus and gonococci and this will lead to outpouring of the purulent exudates and infiltration by the pml that is nothing but the leukocytes and you will have thickening of the uh, uveal tissue along with that necrosis and all these cavities are going to be filled up with pus so in this pictures also you can see this is a site of incision so this is probably end of post surgery so you can see the incision which is gaping and opening and there's lots of pus in the anterior chamber similarly here you can see the haze okay which is coming from the pus in the vitreous and this is the hypopion so this is purulent separator now after the separative or purulent uh, uveitis we have the non separative or the non purulent uveitis in that as i told you there are two types non granulomatous uveitis and the granulomatous uveitis so what is basically meant by this granulomatous uveitis granulomatous uveitis basically as the name suggests there will be granuloma and in pathology if you remember some concepts of pathology a chronic inflammation is also called a granulomatous inflammation because it is characterized by the formation of granulomas right so similarly in granulomatous uveitis also you will have chronic inflammation and this chronic inflammation will occur in response to anything which can act as an irritant foreign body right so it can be a uh, uh, some kind of organisms which are non pyogenic and relatively non virulent in character so this could be like tuberculosis leprosy syphilis brucellosis leptospirosis some of the viral infections fungal infection protozoal infections and even the helminthic infections right so these organisms are basically low virulent and they can cause chronic infections specifically if you remember tuberculosis leprosy syphilis syphilis they tend to form granulomas okay now apart from that there are various kinds of uh, uh, inflammatory conditions of the eye which uh, which can form granulomas and these are the sarcoidosis the sympathetic ophthalmia and then one more is the vkh also called the vogts koenagi haradas disease then we have another type of inflammation which is called the non granulomatous inflammation or the non granulomatous uveitis now this occurs in response to any physical or toxic insult or various kinds of hypersensitivity reactions okay so here we do not have granulomas formation moreover we do not see purulent also so this is also a type of non purulent uveitis now in this non granulomatous uveitis the most common one is actually the hla b27 associated associated disorders so your ankylosis spondylitis psoriatic arthritis so on and so forth like the inflammatory bowel disease they are the ones which will get the non granulomatous uveitis and also this hla b27 associated uveitis is the one which has good prognosis and moreover it also it is also the most common type of non granulomatous uveitis now the other causes could be the bechet disease the lens induced glaucoma the ugh syndrome that is uh, uveitis glaucoma and high fever syndrome the corneal graft rejection the glaucomatocyclic crisis trauma secondary syphilis so the only infection as you can see over here is a secondary syphilis which is causing this non granulomatous uveitis and the normal syphilis will cause the granulomatous uh, uveitis now lens induced glaucoma is your hypersensitivity type of reaction trauma is traumatic uveitis okay similarly corneal graft rejection can also occur because of hypersensitivity right so similarly juvenile chronic arthritis in kids can be associated with non granulomatous uveitis 
and Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis can also be associated with non-granulomatous uveitis. So these are the causes of non-granulomatous uveitis. However, this Woods classification is not a very specific classification because you can actually see some overlap in certain conditions where you can have both granulomatous and uh, non-granulomatous uveitis, specifically like the viral infections where some textbooks mention that they have granulomatous uveitis and some textbooks mention that they have non-granulomatous uveitis. Similarly, in phacoanaphylactic uh, lens induced glaucomas and uh, these conditions also, there is a controversy as to whether they are granulomatous or non-granulomatous uveitis. So basically what happens in granulomatous and non-granulomatous type of uveitis? In granulomatous uveitis, basically what you are going to see is you will see the formation of the granulomas. So basically you will have these lymphocytes, plasma cells and various large mononuclear cells coming up and eventually they're going to aggregate and form these epithelioid giant cells and these are going to aggregate and form these nodular structures called granulomas right so you're going to see this nodular structure almost everywhere in the choroid so if you see it from the anterior to posterior if you see first of all they will get deposited on the back surface of the cornea and that is called the keratic precipitates however these granulomatous ones will be quite bigger ones with greasy appearance and therefore they are called mutton fat keratic precipitates very specific of granulomatous uveitis. Then they can get deposited in the iris as well and they can form the various kinds of nodules. If you see them along the pupillary border they are called the kepis uh, nodules and if you see them in the stroma of the iris then it is called the bisakas nodules. So you, recommend, you can remember them as the kepis has this piece so they are present in the pupillary border and bisaka has this s so they are present in the stroma of the iris. Now what is important is that in granulomatous uveitis since it's a chronic inflammation, uh, inflammation or chronic uveitis, the aqueous flare will usually be very very minimum. Okay. Now in non-granulomatous uveitis, the dilatation and increased probability of vessels is the main feature. Okay, so as the vessels which are present in the iris and ciliary body and the choroid, they will get dilated. They are going to pour a lot of the polymorphonuclear leukocytes and lymphocytes into the anterior chamber and because of their exudation, because of the toxins which are released, the blood aqueous barrier will break and all these fibrinous exudates composed of lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, they are all going to come up in the aqueous chamber and therefore you are going to have a lot of flare, a lot of hyperpion, a lot of hazy view and it is more of a diffuse inflammation rather than forming the nodule. So you don't see any nodular formation. So a very common question that is asked is how do you differentiate granulomatous from the non-granulomatous uveitis. So based upon the onset granulomatous as I told you it's a chronic type of uh, condition so it is, has an insidious onset and the non-granulomatous has more of an acute onset. Pain also acutely will be more in non-granulomatous whereas in granulomatous it will be very very less. Photophobia will be slight and photophobia is marked in non-granulomatous because of more inflammation and more corneal haze and stuff like that. In ciliary congestion is minimal again that means the redness of the eye and I will tell you about all these signs in my next video on the signs of anterior uveitis which is very important and I would advise all of you to uh, just go through that video as well and not to skip it. So here in non-granulomatous you will have marked amount of non uh, ciliary congestion. Coming to keratic precipitates, they will be mutton fat, that means thick, greasy, uh, yellowish deposits, nodules on the cornea, uh, back surface of the cornea, which is the endothelium in granulomatous, and they will be very small KPs in non-granulomatous. Coming to flare, which is the haze that you see in the anterior chamber because of all the exudates which have poured in, as I explained to you, will be very much mild in chronic inflammation in granulomatous, whereas in non-granulomatous, since the vessels are getting dilated and they are pouring all the stuff into the anterior chamber, there will be marked amount of flare in non-granulomatous. Coming to iris nodules, they are usually present, the kepis and the basakas, and even nodules will be present in the fundus, okay, in granulomatous, whereas these nodules will be absent in non-granulomatous and there will be more diffuse involvement in non-granulomatous. Coming to sinicae, which are abnormal adhesions between the iris and the lens, 
okay so you know this is the iris this is lens now the iris has got inflamed and this is going to get attached to the uh, lens and this adhesion which is abnormal okay so normally it is not present because the aqueous is flowing from the posterior chamber through the pupil coming into the anterior chamber now if this adhesion develops this is called posterior sinicae and these will be thick and broad base broad base means that they will be attached at a greater distance okay so broad and wide attachment of these iris will be there on the lens and they are called posterior sinicae so thick broad base sinicae will be present in granulomatous whereas in non granulomatous you will have very thin and tenuous uh, sinicae formation so this pathological picture over here shows you that this is the cornea and you can see on the back surface of cornea this inflammatory cell deposits as clusters so these are the keratic precipitates okay so now in the keratic precipitate you can see here in the diffuse illumination on the slit lamp you can see how yellowish and big fat three dimensional structures you can see on the slit also they are projecting right so they are three dimensional structures okay kps are three dimensional they are not flat so often when you get flat kps either they are non granulomatous or they are old kps so fresh kps usually will have that three dimensional structure so here they also have this fattish appearance greasy appearance these are mutton fat kps now in this picture uh, here i'm trying to demonstrate to you the presence of the uh, posterior sinicae okay so as you can see just a second yeah so here you can see this is the iris normally the iris should not adhere to the lens capsule behind the uh, pupil so you can see this iris is actually attached to the uh, lens present behind and this is called sinicae now over here this is a broad attachment this is broad sinicae and here is a thin attachment this is a thin sinicae now similarly here also you have sinicae and along with that you can see some nodules present on the pupillary border these are the kepis nodule and similarly here you can see this is a nodule here kepis and this one is present in the stroma so this is the basaka's nodule now similarly here in this picture just have a look at these small small kp they are very fine kps and they are non granulomatous kps now in this picture the bottom one you can see the slit and this is nothing but it is depicting basically the aqueous flare so this is the corneal slit and the iris slit and in between actually in a normal case where there is no deposits or where there are no fibrinous exudation in the anterior chamber you will see a total black color appearance of the slit between the cornea and the iris slit okay however whenever the exudates are actually present in between then what we are going to see is we will see this uh, slightly hazy kind of appearance as as i have drawn in between it's looking slightly bluish compared to the other pup outside pupillary area the outside pupillary area is totally black in color whereas this one over here is showing some color to it because of the presence of flare now the last classification is the etiological classification of the uveitis which is given by duke and elder now very it is a very big classification but broadly they said that the uveitis can be idiopathic when we do not know the cause of uveitis it could be inflammatory when there are systemic inflammation like sarcoidosis and uh, sympathetic ophthalmia uh, vox coenaghi harara syndrome like that okay juvenile arthritis then it can be infected secondary to some infections like viral bacterial okay then traumatic traumatic uveitis and neoplastic uh, uveitis which is also called the masquerade uveitis because this is not really uveitis this is actually neoplasms or cancers which are actually mimicking the uveitis so these conditions are lymphoma anterior segment melanoma non neoplastic like juvenile xanthogranuloma so they these conditions can actually mimic uveitis and therefore they are called the masquerade syndromes Thank <laughs> you.